Good morning and welcome to today's event, the Accountability System for the Protection of Civilians in UN Peacekeeping, co-hosted by IPI and the Permanent Mission of the Netherlands. I'm Jake Sherman, Senior Director of Programs at the International Peace Institute. The twin issues of performance and accountability have been central to recent efforts to improve the effectiveness of peacekeeping, including the Secretary General's Action for Peacekeeping Initiative and Security Council Resolution 2436, among other initiatives. The UN peacekeeping ministerials have likewise sought to improve performance by ensuring the availability of specialized and high performing capabilities, as well as by meeting critical training needs. Yet compared to performance, which emphasizes improvement through partnership among the UN and member states, accountability is more sensitive due to its association with determining responsibility for shortcomings or at times failures and with sanction or other punitive action. Both are needed to build a, a shared culture of excellence in peacekeeping. Ultimately, peacekeeping operations are judged, whether by host populations, security council members, or oversight committees and parliaments on how well they protect civilians. While the expectations on peacekeepers to protect civilians are high and missions are often stretched thin, they have at times also failed to act as required. In the past, such failures have resulted in terrible violence and loss of life and damaged the reputation and credibility of UN peacekeeping missions. IPI's latest paper by my colleague, Dr. Nami Raza, the focus of today's event, is an in-depth examination of the issue of accountability, particularly as it concerns the protection of civilians. The paper builds on existing efforts by the UN Secretariat and member states to improve accountability for the protection of civilians. It examines what accountability means in the context of UN peacekeeping. It analyzes existing accountability tools, including how they've been used in specific cases and their limitations. And it provides recommendations to the UN and member states on how to strengthen accountability in the service of improved performance. The policy paper, together with four case studies covering the response to incidents in the Central African Republic, Darfur, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and South Sudan, as well as fact sheets summarizing 16 different accountability mechanisms and tools is available on IPI's website. I should also note that after four years at IPI, where she started and has led our work on protection of civilians, Nami is going to be transitioning back to the UN, where she will continue to work precisely on these issues and will be truly missed. Finally, I wanna thank the government of the Netherlands for its consistent support for IPI's Protection of Civilians project and invite Ambassador Joko Brandt, the permanent representative of the Netherlands to the UN to make opening remarks. Ambassador, please. Um, good, good morning, actually good afternoon uh, for me. Uh, and thank you, uh, uh, Jake, for giving me the opportunity to welcome everybody to this virtual session on accountability and protection. And um, as you said, the Kingdom of the Netherlands is proud to support the work of IPI in the area of protection of civilians. For us, it is uh, part of how we try to give shape to being a champion on protection under the Secretary General's Action for Peacekeeping Initiative. IPI's report on accountability systems for the protection of civilians in UN peacekeeping gives comprehensive insight into trends, gaps and opportunity, as I'm sure we will hear later. It sets out the characteristics of a robust accountability system, which requires clear roles and responsibility, adequate resources, solid monitoring and a system of incentives for good performance and corrective measures for underperformance. And I think it's fair to say that all of the above need improvement as strengthening of accountability is urgently needed if we want to see better results when it comes to protection of civilians in UN peacekeeping. I think all of us who are working with people now know how incredibly important it is to have difficult conversations about underperformance as early as possible. Otherwise, the impression might be that underperformance is okay, or, and perhaps even more importantly, 
the person involved does not get a chance to understand what is wrong, to learn and to improve. Clear objectives and expectations about results help. And we need to look into what's behind the underperformance. Does the, performance, does, does the person have the right tools, the right training, or does he or she simply have too much on his or her plate? I think this analogy also largely holds for peacekeeping. Be clear about objectives and expected results, about roles and responsibilities. Make sure that people are adequately equipped to do the job. Monitor performance and act both when performance is good and when improvements are needed. I look forward to uh, this hopefully not so difficult conversation with all of you uh, on how stronger accountability systems can help UN peacekeeping to for perform better to protect uh, civilians. And let's remember that today is not a one-off. We will continue the discussion. One way the Netherlands will do this is by dedicating a full day of the PrepCom that we will organize together with Pakistan ahead of the UN peacekeeping ministerial on the improvement of protection of civilians. And we are, of course, looking forward to participating at other platforms or forums to bring the discussion forward. Thank you and back over to you, Jake. Thanks so much, Ambassador. Let me now welcome Ms. Bintu Kita, Assistant Secretary General for Africa in the Department of Peace Operations and the Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs. Thanks for joining us, Bintu. Thank you so much, uh, Jake, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Yoka. And I'm, I'm allowed to say Yoka. Uh, uh, sorry for not being protocoler here. Um, just uh, uh, first of all, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and uh, evening, depending on where you are in the world. Excellencies, generals, distinguished uh, guests, and colleagues, I would like to thank IPI and the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs for organizing this event and inviting me to join in this conversation. Hopefully, uh, protecting civilians remains at the heart of United Nations peacekeeping. It was already said. In fact, protecting civilians is consistent with preserving international peace and security. It is therefore our greatest ambition and also our most critical endeavor. I would like to congratulate IPI on the comprehensive and laudable contribution of this paper to frame the debate on accountability for protection of civilians to map and evaluate existing accountability mechanism with her more than 17, and to provide recommendations for a way forward to build a culture of accountability for protection of civilians in United Nations peacekeeping. Performance and accountability. Indeed, a robust performance and accountability framework is essential for successful implementation of our protection of civilian mandates. It's a key element of the Action for Peacekeeping Initiative, as already said by Yoka, mentioning the Action for Peacekeeping. We must recall that protection of civilians is a collective effort that involves member states, including host state and police and troop contributing countries, the Secretariat and peacekeeping operation. On the Secretariat's part, we have been focusing efforts towards a more cohesive performance and accountability structure. In 2020, the Secretariat disseminated the integrated peacekeeping performance and accountability framework. This is the culmination of several years work to measure and strengthen performance and accountability. The framework is an effort to bring all available performance evaluation tools together to improve coherence, identify gaps, and make further progress where needed. It includes measures for all personnel, uniformed and civilian, including senior managers. It sets clear standards linked to mandate implementation. The framework is implemented through 15 priority projects. Each of them is expected to have an impact on accountability and performance. The framework provides steps, amongst others, on how to improve the military and form police units evaluations. This data 
has become crucial to inform sector uh, senior decision makers, generate targeted support to troop and police contributing countries, facilitate capacity building partnership through the light coordination mechanism and inform which remedial measures may be necessary. This should be good news for the troop and police contributing countries. At mission level, capable leadership is essential. Good leadership is necessary to articulate mission-wide priorities and targets and translate them into component units and teams objectives and plans that are consistent with available resources. Several reviews have indeed confirmed that the quality of leadership makes a difference. And I'm happy to have one in this panel because he has conducted a number of these reviews. Ensuring that protection related operational guidance, such as on protection of civilians, gender, conflict related sexual violence and child protection are understood at all levels and translated into practice is another important aspect of protection of civilian performance that relies on capable leadership. Furthermore, the willingness and readiness to act proactively and react robustly at all mission levels to prevent violence is crucial to protecting civilians. Indeed, this willingness and readiness are the very fundamental fundament of deterrence. In conclusion, before closing, I would like to address a couple of notable points from the IPI paper. First, the role of mission comprehensive and integrated approach to protection of civilians. This approach is our greatest strength and is key to sustainable success. Indeed, it is critical to recall that protecting civilians is not only about physical protection by personnel in uniform, Protection is achieved first and foremost through political process. Political settlement processes lie at the heart of the prevention of violence and protection of civilians. They require sustained political and diplomatic engagement. Second, when it comes to political processes, partnerships are essential. Support from the region by neighboring states directly and through relevant sub-regional organization is to put it simply a necessity. So through the paper, though the paper doesn't focus on it, let us not forget about resources. And this was said also earlier. Resources must be, must be commensurate to task. It is essential that member states and the Security Council provide realistic and achievable mandates backed by adequate resources. I look forward to hearing from the other speakers about how we can continue to work together in this important endeavor, and I thank you. Thanks so much, Bintu, particularly for highlighting the extent to which this has been a longstanding priority for the UN. I mean, you mentioned several years uh, in the making, and of course, um, these efforts really stretch far, far uh, beyond that. Uh, I think the whole of mission approach that you mentioned from senior leadership to rank and file personnel across civilian, military, and police components is, uh, is something that we'll, we'll hear from, from Nami about. So very good that you raised it. And of course, the importance of contextualizing the UN's POC efforts as part of the, the wider political process uh, and, and the partnerships and resources that, that underpin that. So with that, let me uh, introduce our panel today. First, we'll hear from Dr. Namida Raza, Senior Fellow and Head of Protection of Civilians at IPI, who will provide an overview of the paper's findings and recommendations. She'll be followed by al Rasim Wan, who's Professor of International Affairs at the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University following senior positions at both the African Union and the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations. Next, Mr. Ludovic Grenouillon, a senior military strategic partnership officer in the Office for Peacekeeping Strategic Partnership at the UN Department of Peace Operations. 
then Mr. Andrew Leva, advisor at the permanent mission of the United States to the United Nations, and then Mr. Yasser Hafawi, counselor at the permanent mission of Morocco to the UN. Uh, following the remarks, we'll have time for discussion and questions from the audience. Uh, ASG Kita and uh, Ambassador Brent will regrettably not be able to, to stay for that. Uh, Nami, over to you. Thank you, Jake. It's um, such a pleasure to present this paper today. As, as you said, it has been a massive research project uh, and I'm really happy to, uh, to summarize it today, although it's an immense challenge to, to do it in a few minutes, but I'll try my best. Um, I think we all agree that over the last two decades, member states and, and the secretariat have developed a rather solid normative framework to define what POC means in UN peacekeeping. And missions in the field have established practical tools to better implement it. Um, but what has been missing really as we entered the third decade of protection of Syrians in peacekeeping mandates is accountability for the proper delivery of protection of civilians mandates for a more consistent, effective and responsible implementation. Accountability can really be the connective tissue between policy and practice by holding actors responsible for the duty to protect. Um, accountability is a virtue and a mechanism. As a virtue, it refers to this obligation or this willingness to accept responsibility and answer to a third party for the way this responsibility is carried out. And as a mechanism, it depends on specific structures, enabling agents to report on their actions and to account for their actions. So the paper looks at accountability debates and accountability structures for POC. And it seeks to do three things, as, as, uh, as uh, mentioned before. First, framing the debate on accountability, which should apply to all stakeholders, not only the military components, not only the leadership of missions, but really all actors involved in the implementation of POC. Um, it also um, seeks to provide an extensive mapping of existing tools that can be used to assess performance, to sanction performance and incentivize performance. And uh, the paper also takes stock of recent initiatives and efforts led by member states and the secretariat to improve accountability for POC. Um, as you said, Jake, accountability is a complex and sensitive topic and one that often raises passionate discussions and, and sometimes tensions because it's often associated with this idea of blame, uh, with this primitive narratives around performance, but the paper really seeks to demystify accountability and promote a culture of shared proactive accountability for POC for all stakeholders. Um, it first outlines four critical dimensions to build a robust system of accountability. Um, to hold people accountable, first you need to have clear roles and responsibilities for those who execute the mandate. Um, so you need to clarify expectations um, and, and make sure that uh, everybody understands what are the roles and responsibilities, what are the, the minimum standards and the expectations. On top of that, you also need to provide resources as, as, uh, was, uh, as it was mentioned before. You cannot hold people responsible or accountable for implementing POC if you don't provide the necessary resources, material resources, human resources, but also the appropriate rules and regulations that will enable peacekeepers to properly deliver on their mandate. And once you have clarified roles and responsibilities and, and provided resources, you need a system to track actual performance and actual behavior. So you need performance monitoring and oversight. And, and you need to do it regularly, but also retroactively in cases of allegations of failures. Um, and then the fourth um, dimension that is really important beyond performance monitoring is a system of sanction incentives. You need to go beyond assessing performance and you need to ensure that there will be consequences and corrective measures depending on the level of performance. So the paper then offers some guiding principles to build a robust system of accountability for POC, but it also highlights unique challenges um, that are due to the very nature of protection of civilians in peacekeeping. Take, for example, attribution, which is key in accountability. You need to attribute responsibility. Um, but attribution can be very difficult as protection of civilians is a broad institutional goal that involves a lot of different actors, the military component, the police, the civilians, 
missions and headquarters, member states. So attributing responsibility can, for POC failure can really be challenging. Um, answerability is also a key component of accountability. Um, answerability is this obligation to report to a third party, and it's what differentiates accountability system from internal monitoring and evaluation processes. Um, but again, in peacekeeping, answerability can be challenging um, because peacekeeping is really based on horizontal partnerships. You also have sometimes confusing reporting lines or, or um, command and, and control. And also it raises the question of whom peacekeeping operations are accountable to. Is it the Security Council? Is it the capitals of member states or the Secretariat headquarters uh, of the local populations, which are very often neglected in these debates on accountability? So this question remains open. Um, another key principle is enforcement. Um, to have a robust system of accountability, you need to enforce consequences um, when there is underperformance. But um, most solutions at, at the UN in the context of peacekeeping and protection, most solutions remain process oriented and they are limited to soft corrective decisions very often rather than sanctions. Performance for POC is seen as this continuum along which mission can improve and there are no broadly recognized off target performance indicators or, or red lines that would trigger sanctions automatically and consistently. Sanctions are de facto extremely politicized and, and do not happen very often. And, and finally, transparency is important for accountability. But again, it's quite limited due to political and institutional sensitivities. Reports into um, investigations into um, POC failures are not always public. Singling out a contingent publicly, publicly is also very difficult. And as a result, the, the locus of accountability is very often internal. So building on, on these, this analysis, the paper offers a, a mapping and an evaluation of the different accountability mechanisms that do exist and that can be used for POC. Um, we looked at individual performance monitoring uh, tools like the EPAS, the Compacts for senior leaders. We also looked into regular performance monitoring for the mission and uniformed components, the CPAS, the force commanders evaluation, police evaluations, mission evaluations. And we looked at investigative mechanisms, um, boards of inquiry, the role of OIOS, the reviews led by the Office for Peacekeeping Strategic Partnership, um, special investigations or conduct and discipline processes, for example. And we also analyzed um, the existing incentives like medals or the risk premiums that can be added to the reimbursement for troop contributing countries. So I cannot get into the detailed analysis of, of all these tools, but maybe a few lessons um, uh, today. It's, the first lesson is that there is a lot of internal mechanisms to monitor performance, um, and, and that's the good news. But they also have limited means and impact. They also tend to focus on self-evaluation, which raises inherent issues of impartiality and answerability. They are independent tools that instill a stronger sense of accountability like OIOS or VOPSP or independent special investigations. Um, those are, are really credible because they bring this independence and a lot of expertise, but, and they have a better impact very often, um, but they are not used consistently for POC and generally we need more resources and expertise for professional impartial assessments. Another lesson is that uh, there is a focus on institutional accountability rather than individual accountability. Um, tools to assess individual performance are quite limited um, and tools to look at, at missions uh, or uniformed components, for example, as a whole are, are more uh, numerous uh, and, and they, so we have more for missions and components than we have for specific individuals. And as a result, we also tend to focus on improved processes collaborative learning um, and, and discussions around performance rather than sanctions. And of course, both are needed. Learning and accountability are both needed and we need to strike the right balance. But, but very often there's, there's a, uh, a, a limitation in, in the use of sanctions that are politicized and applied inconsistently and that only tend to occur when there's a mix of media attention and political pressure and strong leadership. Um, another lesson maybe uh, from the mapping is that there is also, there tends to be a focus on 
tools for uniformed components. We have developed in the past years a lot of performance monitoring tools for the military and the police, and less so for civilian components, which in a way it's understandable because uniformed components are also uh, on the front line to provide physical protection. And uh, when there is a failure, they're very often uh, uh, highlighted. Um, but at the same time, the performance of civilians is also critical uh, and it can influence the performance of, of the, the military counterparts or the police counterparts, but there are less tools to uh, look at civilian components. There's not the same level of scrutiny for um, the, the results, the, the, the mission's performance in um, pursuing political um, solutions for the protection of civilians or properly analyzing threats or prioritizing threats. Um, so, um, so that's also something that, that uh, was identified in the mapping. And, and, uh, and maybe one final thing for the mapping is that accountability processes generally are not well known and well understood. And they are often confusing and quite duplicative. Um, staff do not always know how to activate or use accountability tools. Um, the tools are also activated simultaneously and not in a very coherent way without a clear sequence or, or clear communication flows. Um, so those are, are, are the big lessons from the mapping and I, I know I, I'm running out of time so maybe just quickly on some of the recommendations. There are a lot of recommendations in the paper. Uh, to build a culture of accountability that should go beyond a system of tools. At the same time, streamlining and strengthening the system of tools and, and the system that does exist is, is important. So there's a first set of recommendations about building a more cohesive structure, um, streamlining processes, improving coordination between the different tools, ensuring that they exchange information, that there is a better transmissibility of information. Also, not only between UN tools, but between the tools of the UN and the ones uh, used by member states to look at performance and, and correct performance. Also training staff on accountability is very important so that they understand how it works and just generally broadening the scope of accountability tools to capture the multidimensional character of POC. Um, also strengthening independent, dedicated, uh, transparent tools is very important. Um, using investigative, independent investigative teams to look into underperformance, but also to follow up on uh, the recommendations. So I recommend strengthening um, the multidimensional character of the OPSP reviews, um, using more investigative teams, uh, independent teams, also have more dedicated resources for POC in particular, and generally balancing transparency and politics and ensuring that the, the assessments are more transparent. The corrective measures are also transparent. Um, and finally, and I'll stop there, uh, as a last set of recommendation, it's important to enforce consequences and develop incentives. So following up on shortcomings, having clear standards and triggers for sanctions. Um, we need to hold peacekeepers to account when they flagrantly, blatantly, and chronically fail to meet basic requirements for POC. These requirements should be clarified, of course, and they should offer some red lines for underperformance. But, but generally we need uh, to, to have more consequences and uh, also to consider POC performance as a weighted criteria in the selection of personnel and future force generation. And beyond punitive approaches, rewarding outstanding performance and using um, positive tools uh, to recognize good performance, but also put in place internal communication strategies to create Pride, a pride to protect civilians beyond the bureaucratic tools and processes. This is critical to ensure that there's a culture of accountability for POC in peacekeeping. I'll stop there. Thank you, Jake. Thanks so much, Nami. There, there's so much there, and, and you really just glossed the surface of, of what is quite an in depth report. Maybe just to, to highlight a few things that you said. I mean, it's it's clear, and this has been touched on in the opening remarks as well, that there are many different stakeholders involved in effective protection of civilians. It's dependent on a lot of variables and that there's a, there's a risk of diffusion of responsibility. And yet I think already we're seeing a consistent message around accountability needing to apply to all stakeholders and the need for clear roles and responsibilities for resources to regularly track performance and to enforce uh, both sanctions and provide incentives as, as part of the system to address this. 
Um, I'm sure these issues will be touched on by our, uh, our next speaker, uh, El Ghassam Wan. You were at the then Department of Peacekeeping Operations during several high profile incidents and, and recently led an internal study for the UN on the protection of civilians. What, what's your perspective on these issues? Yes. <coughs> so th thank you so much uh, for, the, uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to take the floor uh, on the occasion of the launching of this uh, uh, IPI report on accountability for uh, POC. Uh, let me start by commending uh, IPI, of course, and in particular, uh, Nami Diraza for this extensively researched and comprehensive document. It's a timely uh, undertaking uh, coming as it does uh, against the backdrop of renewed efforts and attention to strengthen uh, performance on POC as illustrated among others by the Secretary General, uh, United Nations Secretary General Action for, uh, for Peacekeeping. Uh, I would like to make a few uh, general points uh, informed by uh, my own experience. Indeed, I was at the, the UN, uh, as you pointed out, uh, during some of these uh, high profile um, incidents on POC, uh, but also based on my experience at the African Union. Uh, I think it has some relevance on the, to, the, to the issue. First, uh, and speaking more specifically about the African context, which in my view is the most relevant for peacekeeping, as the majority of operations are deployed on the African continent, it seems to me that uh, the protection of civilians will continue to be a key aspect of United Nations peacekeeping in the period ahead, and so I would say in the many years ahead. Uh, there are a number of reasons that are at play here. Uh, let me just list two of them. One is linked to the nature of conflict in Africa, and the second one to the willingness of the Security Council to deploy missions uh, uh, not only in situations where there is a clear political framework, but also in environments where the political framework, at least initially, uh, is not uh, very clearly shaped. Uh, second, and deriving from this observation, I, I believe that every effort should be made to enhance the effectiveness of peacekeeping operations that are tasked with POC mandates. And here, while missions have made commendable achievements, uh, as shown by the clear life-saving effect of their interventions, I believe that all concerned stakeholders would recognize that there is room for further progress. And any step towards enhanced accountability, as proposed in the report, will definitely assist the ongoing efforts and help achieve better outcomes. And in this respect, I would like to note the report's recommendations, in particular those relating to performance monitoring, tracking, and oversight, as well as those relating to measures that could be taken to encourage effective delivery and take corrective, uh, take corrective course of action. Uh, the proposal made to ensure that punitive measures, which are a necessary component of any working accountability system, are complemented by incentives if pursued proactively can open up new avenues towards more effective performance. Third, while practical and specific measures are called for to further accountability for POC, and the report has made a number of uh, suggestions in this respect, these suggestions will unfortunately have a limited impact if not backed by continued and enhanced political commitment. Uh, I think it's a point that the report does acknowledge, not only by making reference to the numerous initiatives taken by a variety of government stakeholders, member states acting individually or collectively, as in the framework of the Kigali principles, but also the Security Council. But it is also a point that the report makes by formulating specific recommendations on what more could be done. And here I think, and it is an aspect that is not covered in the report, uh, which I have read, but I hope I've not missed it. There is need for renewed efforts to ensure that key UN partners, such as the AU and its regional mechanisms, are brought into the POC con uh, con conversation in a stronger way. 
there is much in my view that these entities can do to echo and amplify UN concerns and priorities on POC, including accountability. They can also take more tangible actions on the ground by leveraging the comparative advantage, advantages of some of their institutions. The key point here is really to move away from a situation in which, uh, from a situation where POC in UN peacekeeping settings is seen as being merely a UN priority and treated as a bilateral matter between the UN and host countries to a situation where the conversation around the protection of civilians is made more inclusive and for lack of a better word, I would say multilateralized. I could explain it further. Fourth, and as pointed out by Bintu, POC cannot and shouldn't be delinked from the search for political solutions. And this points to the need uh, to the critical importance of continued efforts to give a more practical meaning to the primacy of uh, politics. In this respect, and as the report recommends, there is need for the Security Council to continue doing all it can to push for political solutions and conflict resolution. I would see two additional complementary steps here. First, leveraging the UN system as a whole, headquarter-based political human rights and specialized protection mandates, high-level board of mediation and other entities to strengthen political engagement. Second, and as reiterated as uh, um, stated by Bintu, building regional coalitions of support, including greater engagement of regional stakeholders. There is no doubt that neighboring countries and regional institutions stand to benefit immensely from the stabilization of countries where peacekeeping operations are deployed. As such, these actors have a huge stake in the success of PKOs. Every effort should therefore be made to ensure sustained support on all aspects of mandate implementation, including uh, POC. Fifth and last, an effective accountability system should factor in the informational environment of UN operations, especially in view of the widespread availability and use of social media in conflict zones communicating strategically with all concerned stakeholders, populations living in conflict zones, host authorities, think tanks, the press, concerned international actors can help in furthering accountability, especially by clearly articulating what a peacekeeping operation can do and what it can do. And more generally, I believe that strategic communication should be an integral part of all UN mission activities, keeping in mind that campaigns of disinformation and misinformation directed at times against UN operations not only pose a risk in terms of reputation, but also by undermining the credibility of these operations can impair their ability to act, including in protecting civilians. I thank you. Well, awesome. Thanks so much. And I, I do hope in the discussion we'll have time to come back uh, to this point about the multilateralization of, of protection and, and allow you to elaborate on that. But um, also wanted to highlight, I mean, there, again, a, a lot of recommendations in there. This point about leveraging the wider UN system and, and as we've been discussing today, POC in a peacekeeping context isn't just about the uniform component. I, if I hear you correctly, you're making an argument. It's also not just about the peacekeeping mission. It, it's the responsibility of, uh, of the entire UN system on the ground, working in partnership, obviously, with the host country and, and with others. Um, and I think the point about strategic communication is, is very well made and, and the sort of dual role of technology where we see social media and radio and, and technology being used to mobilize violence against civilians, but it also is a potentially effective tool, per, perhaps one that's being underutilized for the mission to better convey to host populations and to other stakeholders what it can and, and cannot do. Uh, Ludovic, let me turn to you. The, the Office of Peacekeeping Strategic Partnership, o OPSP, works with troop and police contributing countries to identify gaps that may impact the delivery of mandates. What are, what are your views uh, on the role of accountability in the protection of civilians from where you sit? 
Yeah, thank you and good morning, uh, good afternoon to all participants. So I am Ludovic Grenoyon. I am the military expert for OPSP, which is the Office for Peacekeeping Strategic Partnership. And we are in the Department of Peace Operation. So for those who don't know our office, we I would say that we are the equivalent of a general inspection for DPO. Our very small office is composed of a director, usually a retired officer who has been a force commander or a police commissioner in a mission. We have a military expert, a police expert, and a logistic expert. So very quickly, I will give you the point of view of one of the actors in terms of accountability and describe our working methodology. So first, our office is placed directly under the USG for DPO, and we review all missions on a regular basis. We produce report where we focus much more on the finding than uh, on the recommendation. So one of the characteristics I would say of our office is its independence. So that gives us freedom of tone and uh, that guarantee also the integrity of our report. Another characteristic is that we have no executive mandate. Uh, our recommendations are non-binding. That's why our priority is to identify the problem and their causes, and then we work with all stakeholders to implement solutions. So, of course, our office welcomes the publication of the IPI report, and for sure we'll have a close look at it, uh, because POC and accountability for POC is a recurring theme in our review, and even a central theme when we are mandated to conduct special investigation. So, for example, our office conducted uh, an investigation following the Alindao massacre in uh, Central African Republic. So in terms of POC, we regularly identify shortcomings, but also good practices that we share with all stakeholders, but we can also establish responsibility and we can propose sanction. So, and as, as such, we be one of the actors identified by the IPI report in the UN accountability mechanism. So I would say that the added value of our office uh, for DPO is without no doubt the fact that we spend 40% of our time in the field, even in the most remote part of the mission. For example, we have just returned for one month uh, in Mali where we have visited all bases and all camp. So we therefore have a very clear idea of what is happening in the field and what are the difficulty encountered by the mission in implementing their POC strategy. Um, I would say that uh, our contribution to the accountability mechanism is done at two levels. A first level, which is quite general by identifying gaps that are systemic and that we encounter in the majority of missions. A second level, which is more specific, which is more related to special investigations and where we can clearly identify failure and propose sanction for a specific case. So that said, I would like to share with you a point that we, that we see sometimes in terms of accountability. That's the difficulty of implementing a fair and complete accountability. Um, the IPI report uh, uh, described that fact in the, follow in the following way. So I quote, emphasis on the performance of military unit whose accountability for the provision of physical protection may seem easier to establish. Quite often the contingent are blamed for their failure. And sometimes this is perfectly justified. However, even justified, it can sometimes be unfair and incomplete in terms of accountability. So in various investigation, even before we start, the force or the contingent was proposed to us as the ideal culprit. But we have to admit that they were the only one present on the scene. And one of our recurrent finding is that in many remote uh, location, the substantive pillar of the police component are not deployed. And for various reasons that we can discuss later, uh, even though they play a crucial role in each of the three tier, as they are described in the UN uh, POC policy, uh, particularly in terms of prevention in the context of inter-community, inter-ethnic and religious violence, in all violence where crowds are manipulated. So we forgot or we forget that alone in the field and without interpreters or substantive, it's difficult for a force not always experience in engaging with population to avoid escalation. And then once the event is triggered, it's often too late. Even a very well-trained force will, will have enormous difficulty to, to control a crowd determined to launch into a massacre. So 
We are convinced that accountability should not stop at the failure of the force. We must be able to apply the accountability mechanism to all the actors involved. So we should be able to establish the accountability to give a task that is not achievable, starting from the Security Council to SRAG, to head of office, to commander on the ground, the accountability to fully implement the treaty of POC to integration and physical presence of all pillars, and the accountability for those who are absent. So to conclude, I want to mention that uh, OPSP is described in the IPI report as one of the actors capable of looking at all the components in terms of accountability, even if our experience is more focused on uniform. But uh, we are already ahead of one of the recommendation uh, on of one of the report recommendation as far as, as our office is concerned. So thanks to a donor country, we are happy to say that we are in the process of recruiting a substantive expert to complete our team, which will now have the full range of expertise with substantive military police and logistical expertise. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Ludovic, and, and for highlighting uh, what perhaps isn't uh, as well known a, a role as, as it should be in terms of the Office of, of Peacekeeping Strategic Partnership and the establishment of responsibility, the proposal of sanction, the ability to, to make recommendations uh, to troop and police contributing countries to improve their performance, but also for, for highlighting some of the difficulties around this, as you put it, implementing fair and complete accountability. Andrew, uh, let me now turn to you. Uh, the United States, of course, has been a longstanding champion of improved performance and accountability in peacekeeping from supporting the development of standards in the form of unit manuals and uh, the operational readiness and assurance policy that's been referred to, to Security Council Resolution 2436. Um, so please, what are, what are your thoughts on this issue? Thank you very much, Jake, and, and good morning, everyone. And then thank you to IPI and the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs for putting on this important event. Um, thank you as well to Assistant Secretary General Kita and, and Ambassador Brandt for your compelling opening remarks and to Dr. DeRaza for, for producing such a fantastic report with, with very concrete recommendations. Um, it, it's, it's a really, really good uh, effort and very much appreciated. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to discuss this issue today because, you know, frankly, and this has been alluded to by other panelists, I, I believe accountability too often gets mischaracterized as a blame game or turns into a blame game between different member states when in fact we very much share common goals and desired outcomes here. And I'll use a, an example to illustrate this point. So just two years ago, uh, more than 100 internally displaced people, in, including children, were murdered at an IDP camp in Alindao in the Central African Republic. MINUSCO was present at the scene and there was advanced warning of the impending atrocity but UN peacekeepers were not capable of preventing or countering the attack by the armed group UPC. More than 100 innocent people were murdered with armed peacekeepers standing right there. Now, once it became clear what had happened, the UN repatriated a portion of the TCC component that was present during the attack. They also instituted a careful pre-deployment assessment process before rotating in new units from that contingent to the mission. And, and let's fast forward and look at uh, the situation today. MINUSCO is operating in Northeastern CAR, in an area with fierce fighting between rival armed groups. And in the face of significant pressure, the Zambian troops deployed there, who, who all know that were not the same contingent as those present in Alindao, have pr performed impressively in, in protecting civilians and trying to halt the violence. And this change in dynamics came because of strong accountability. But to achieve it, the failure to protect civilians needed to first be brought to light. That is to say, transparency was needed, both to understand how and where to, to make the course corrections to address it. We also recognize that in protecting civilians, there, there may be risks to the peacekeepers themselves. But the very measures that allow peacekeepers to better protect civilians, gaining the trust of the people they seek to protect, developing a strong situational awareness of, the AO, of, of their AOR and projecting strength 
also reduce the risks to peacekeepers. As General Dos Do Santos Cruz noted, nobody attacks a stronger opponent. So, you know, these are the these are the common goals that we share. While there may be differing opinions amongst member states on how to do it, how to achieve it, I think we can all agree that, that current and future peacekeeping operations must be able to anticipate and prevent another atrocity like that in Aline Dao. And at the same time, we also agree on the importance of reducing unnecessary risks to peacekeepers. Fortuitously, these two goals go hand in hand. I'd like to now quickly take stock of progress in implementing Security Council 2436, uh, which covered several of the objectives that are mentioned in, in uh, NAMI's report that we're discussing today. First, we welcome the accountability framework rolled out by UNDPO three months ago. As, as Dr. DeRaza lays out in her report, many assessment tools were developed over the past few years to lay the foundation for this framework, uh, CPAS, MPET, OPSP, and, and several other acronyms uh, that, that have, they're all very good efforts. And this framework uh, also places a heavy emphasis on POC. It ensures a thorough understanding of POC policies and rules of engagement. Uh, rewarding, it rewards, uh, talks about rewarding exceptional actions um, and, and investigating POC failures. So it, it represents a very positive end to the first chapter of accountability efforts of what I think will be, a, you know, is, is a very large book. As a Security Council member, we also really appreciate the quarterly informal briefings from the UN to the Council on Performance, both good and bad, and believe that these are very useful and, and uh, important to continue. One issue, however, is that the Council only receives anonymized ad hoc examples of underperformers being held accountable. Without, full, full, without fuller information, how can the Council follow up bilaterally, uh, ensure accountability measures are, are having the proper effect, and, and work to help address these issues? We have particularly limited visibility for how civilian staff are held accountable for failures in performance. And, and what we do know is not encouraging. We also all know that uh, capable and accountability leadership uh, accountable, sorry, capable and accountable leadership makes a big difference. Force commanders and contingent commanders must continually assess subordinate units thoroughly, accurately, and consistently. Those assessments must be shared. Force commanders should feed deficiencies and operational requirements back to UN headquarters so that they can be addressed. And contingent commanders must capture and pass on to their national training centers the lessons learned in their areas of operation. You know, the nature of peacekeeping operations with so many uh, um, rotations in and out, you know, keeping those lessons learned, not relearning the lessons over and over is, is vital. And mission leadership themselves should be assessed and held accountable. It is also vital to deploy the right units and individuals. Strides have been made in, in the right direction here, but the, the force generation process should be based primarily on performance and capability, not on political considerations. Only the most ready, willing, and able troops should deploy to missions. I'll also note, you know, we've, we've referenced here the, the negative uh, connotations around the word accountability, but it, it doesn't only mean consequences for, for negative actions. And we agree with, uh, with NAMI's report and with the new accountability framework on the importance of recognizing outstanding performance, particularly by TMPCCs in the field. We often hear anecdotally of, of units taking great risks to protect civilians from violence. And these units and individuals should be honored by name and mentioned by the Secretariat in regular reporting to the Security Council. Conversely, when deficiencies are uncovered, the UN can use its light coordination mechanism to find specific assistance for TMPCCs. Again, this, this is where transparency is so vital. It allows the council and member states to know where and how to offer support. The, the United States and Rwanda plan to demonstrate in concrete terms how we turn these words into action. So um, very specifically, you know, we often do talk around these issues, but we want to uh, move words into action and, and kind of show some concrete steps of, of where we can really uh, further th this conversation on POC. Um, and so in, in the lead up to next year's peacekeeping ministerial, uh, we'll be showing how uh, a partnership where, where both sides 
transparently hold themselves and each other accountable has led to positive results in the field. And we'll be focusing, uh, of course, on the US Rwandan partnership there. So in short, we believe that increased transparency will improve the accountability system for the protection of civilians. And transparency, not to name and shame underperformers, but rather to empower peacekeepers who can achieve their protection mandates while keeping themselves safe and secure. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Andrew, not least for providing a, a very tangible example of, of the, the consequences of, of protection failures and why we're having this discussion, but I think also incredibly valuable the perspective of the US as a permanent member of the council, as a, a longstanding champion of this issue, as I'd said, and you know, the, the proposals that you raised in terms of you know, how to strengthen the quarterly informal briefings to the council to enable the, it to, to better follow up and take action, whether in terms of punitive measures and sanctions, but also uh, offering training, support, equipment through mechanisms like uh, the light coordination mechanism, which you mentioned. Uh, also important, this, this point you raised about force generation. And I think there has been a real effort within the secretariat to get better about using performance data in, uh, in the generation and deployment of units. But as you said, uh, those units that deploy uh, should be the ones that are most ready, willing, and, and able. Uh, in a way, that's a great segue to our, our last speaker. Um, yes, sir, Morocco is a top contributing country. Uh, you have deployments in, in some, some fairly difficult peacekeeping environments. And of course, you yourself are the coordinator for the non-aligned movement, which includes most troop and police contributing countries and is engaged in uh, negotiations on these issues in venues like the, the Special Committee on Peacekeeping. Um, so please, over to you. Commissioner of Netherlands for organizing this very interesting uh, um, session this morning and, and, uh, and thank them also for this opportunity to, to share some views as, as the expert of on peacekeeping at, at the Moroccan mission, as you said, but also as an AMCO coordinator. Obviously, I'm speaking on my name, not as an AMCO coordinator, but uh, I'll do my best to, to try to best the to give a sort of a, a troop contributing uh, point of view to this discussion. I'd also like to congratulate uh, Dr. Diraza for the excellent report, really, beyond the normative framework and the policy guidance. The objectives, of, the objectives of, of the report need to be praised. And I quote here, this paper seeks to shift the debate around accountability from a punitive confronta confrontational narrative of blame to a positive, inclusive, and empowering one. Indeed, one of the main challenges to effective peacekeeping is trust, and trust between the different actors is key, which is why as, as a, an active TCC, we constantly call for the reinforcement of the triangular cooperation between the TCCs, the Secretary, Security Council and the Secretariat. Trust or lack of trust in this case can have a major impact on the various processes, as for example, it was the case for peacekeeping intelligence. It took a great line of efforts to try as much as possible to reconcile the different views on this critical issue. I mentioned this because now I've introduced a new subchapter on the issue before the foundation of the policy by, at that time, DPKO, to ensure that any peacekeeping intelligent resources are used only to protect peacekeepers, as well as for the protection of civilians. To illustrate the complexity of accountability, I'd like to share with you briefly an interesting example, which may explain why the AMUSU report that is mentioned in the IPI report as well was not made public. Back in 2017, the Moroccan platoon composed of 18 soldiers was ta tasked to protect a logistical convoy composed of 27 vehicles. Having to stay an extra night in their location because of a mechanical failure from the platoon tasked to take over, they heard clashes nearby around 9 a.m. The commander of the platoon immediately informed the HQ in Bangui and requested instructions on whether to stick to their task or intervene. And intervene without necessarily having the, the knowledge of who they might confront on the other side. Um, so until three, no instructions uh, came until 2, 3 p.m. when they received instructions to stick to their initial task, which is to protect the convoy. Um, unfortunately, there were uh, casualties in the civilian population after that incident. And that's where the, the AMUSU report uh, comes in. Um, 
I just want to reiterate that you know Morocco as a TCC is fully committed to prosecute any any of his soldiers in case of proof failure. But this example gives gives us um, a sort of an idea about the complexity uh, of accountability in this case. Who should be held accountable? Uh, and you know, clarification that were mentioned by the previous speakers in this in this case is very important. Um, Allow me to, to underline a few points uh, before I conclude. So uh, the importance to manage expectations. So as it was said, missions are usually quite stretched. It's, uh, it's very difficult to expect from a, a contagion of 800 troops to, um, to, to secure an area as big as uh, Belgium, for example. Um, although it is their mandate and they do their best, but with the resources at their, uh, at their disposal. So factors like resources, performance, and caveats are very important in this regard. However, accountability is also very important, and I would like to take this opportunity to express my full support to the three recommendations in the beginning of the report, in particular the streamlining of the numerous UN accountability structures, which I think is the easiest one to implement. Based on the case of Amusu report, clarifying the roles of and responsibilities is key, and incentives are also a tool that is not used enough, to my opinion, uh, until today. Last but not least, uh, thank you very much again for, for this opportunity and for this report that we will definitely benefit um, in our preparation for the next C34. As you may know, we are in, in this, uh, this uh, um, mid-December, uh, mid-January, we're supposed to, uh, to provide our, our, um, our proposal. So I, it will definitely be a very useful um, report for us. And uh, thank you very much, Steve. Yes, sir. Thanks so much for, for offering a, a, a TCC perspective. Um, and I think there were a number of, of issues that you raised as well that, that I hope we can, we can pick up in, in the discussion. We've got about uh, 25 minutes left. Um, for those of you that are participating uh, in the moment and, and in the room, I invite you to uh, type any questions or comments that you might have in the Q&A function of, uh, of Zoom and, and we'll pick those up. But in the interim, um, I wanted to, to start us off with, uh, with a few questions. Um, first off, uh, El uh, I'd, I'd like to come back to you at some point and, and allow you to elaborate on, on the point that you made during your remarks about the, the, this multilateralization of protection. Um, but I, a couple questions that I, I wanted to, to raise, and, and one is about the, the political nature of this. And, and several of you have touched on, uh, on the sensitivities around accountability. Uh, we know that in, in several missions, there are very few troop contributing countries that are willing to deploy units to some of the most remote, inhospitable, insecure environments. And that, that often has left the UN in a very difficult position when it comes to uh, making determinations around uh, accountability. So uh, one question is how does the UN strike the right balance between these political considerations uh, on accountability? And, and ensuring consistency, particularly when uh, when some of the TCCs or PCCs involved might be uh, quite influential, if not uh, powerful, uh, member states. And I think related to that, a, a number of you have have talked about the role of uh, red lines, um, and I think this gets at the point about consistency, but it'd, I'd be interested in hearing uh, from all of you your thoughts on what some of the challenges have been around the implementation of red lines or indeed sort of what what your views on for, you know, are, are there, is there a clear sense of, of what some of those red lines should, should consist of? And then finally, uh, Yasser, I was actually surprised you were the only one at least that I that I heard during the presentation that raised the issue of uh, of national caveats. Um, this, of course, has been uh, a, a very sensitive issue with a lot of uh, debate uh, among member states about how to handle caveats. And and I'd be interested for views. Uh, I'd be interested in in 
views of the speakers on, on this issue of national caveats and how best to address them. So maybe um, with those questions on the table, I can turn back to the panel and uh, as more questions trickle in from the audience, we can take those as well. But why don't we go um, in the order of speakers this time? So Nami, let me, let me start with you. And if there's any other points that were raised by other speakers that you want to uh, address, please feel free as well. Thanks, Jake. Um, it was a very important question uh, and it's not easy to, to, to answer uh, in a few minutes, but about red lines and about the challenges uh, to, to really have a system to sanction underperformance. I think one of the things that was raised by many interlocutors was this difficulty, this, this challenge to actually have clear criteria. Um, so what is the basis for sanctions? Uh, because again, each POC incident is very different. For each POC incident, you have a very different set of political factors uh, that played out. Uh, institutional uh, impediments, uh, complex uh, uh, dynamics within the mission, and maybe a lack of proactiveness from from uh, from the military, or maybe the civilians that did not coordinate well or did not analyze the situation well. So, I think the problem is that um, the indicators and the CPAS in, in that regard has been really a, a, a positive step. Uh, I think very often in the past we've been looking at criteria that did not speak uh, of the actual performance and impact of the mission. And all the criteria that we were looking at were about the outputs of the mission, the meetings that were convened and the patrols that were done. And, and, and that's pretty much it. And there was this lack of understanding of the actual impact. Um, but I think the CPAS is really making an effort in that sense to look at the outcomes of the mission and the impact and to integrate the data it collects to inform decision making. Um, generally, I think that you can uh, have a good system where you have systematized sanctions for the most blatant uh, failures to protect civilians. Uh, a refusal to follow orders, for example, should always be documented. Um, and and that's, that's quite the obvious case of, of, a, of a, a POC failure. Of course, very often orders are not really, um, uh, like the military is not refusing explicitly to follow orders. And then you get into this gray area, investigations need to be conducted. One thing that can help in terms of balancing the transparency and politics is to have these investigations being transparent and being public. Um, very often, I think that the UN to, to um, be careful about politics and, 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 and to, uh, to uh, avoid politicizing the issue um, will actually tend to protect the information, to, to, uh, to uh, keep everything confidential. I think in some cases, having a transparent process, having the public also looking at findings from investigations is what can ensure that it won't be politicized. It's impossible to politicize it because everything will be out. And, and I think that we should really take into account that the, the role of external actors and independent actors and the public can really help depoliticizing the, the whole issue. And then once you have independent uh, assessments, I think you can have a system of sanctions. And again, if the, the sanctions that are taken are transparent, then uh, it's, easier to show that it's not politicized, that actually it's been applied consistently throughout uh, uh, the different incidents. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a complicated issue, I'll stop there, but, but I'm, I actually look forward to hearing other speakers uh, uh, discussing this as well. Hey, thanks, Tommy. And this point about increased transparency was, uh, was something that uh, both uh, El Rasim and, uh, and Andrew mentioned. And, and I think you're right about the point that the, the greater transparency is a way of demonstrating that decisions are are consistent and, and not being politicized. I'll ask him, could I could I turn to to you for any thoughts on the questions on the table? Okay, yeah. Thank 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 you so much. Uh, maybe let me just come back to the to the point I made about uh, uh, what I called multilateralizing uh, protection POC. Uh, of course, I said it may not be the adequate word because 
uh, where the UN is a multilateral institution, so you can say whatever is uh, being handled by the UN is already multilateral in nature. But the point I'm trying to make here is uh, as follows. Um, you know, and I really am, uh, I'm taking it from my own experience at the UN, but also at the AU, looking at it from the other side. You know, often when you deal with, uh, you know, in dealing with many of uh, these African conflicts and crises, uh, African institutions play an important role in mediation, in trying to find a political solution, and then the UN comes in uh, either directly or taking over from an African institution and deploys an operation. And then it is as if uh, all operational issues linked to the implementation of the mandate are, um, you know, are matters that should be dealt with only by the UN. Uh, it is as if, you know, once the African institutions have facilitated with the support of the UN and other partners, bilateral partners, facilitated the conclusion of an agreement that their role is, is done, uh, that they have completed the task, you know, that was, uh, that they're supposed to, 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 to execute. And I believe it's a, it's a mistake in my view, because of course POC, uh, well, is also, uh, is also highly political, uh, as you know. Uh, and especially in countries where, um, you know, government forces are involved in, uh, um, in violence against civilians. So what you want to do is really to increase political leverage, uh, to increase political leverage and to increase support for the mission as it executes its mandate uh, to protect civilians. And you would like to see a strong support as possible for the mission and when there are abuses, you would like to see as many members of the international community as possible taking the floor and speaking out. And I think the more they do it, the stronger uh, the position of the mission is. Uh, and the point I was making when I say that these matters should not be dealt with as if they, they were a bilateral issue between the UN and the host country. Because then, you know, you restrict the conversation. Uh, as the members of the international community, you know, may or especially neighboring countries and others, you know, may think that this is a matter that concerns the mission, not them. And yet, uh, you know, they, they fully know, and uh, you know, it's clear that if issues linked to protection are not resolved, it is extremely difficult to find a lasting political solution. And obviously, if there is no lasting political solution, there is no way that you can address protection issues in a sustainable fashion. So I believe the more they are involved, the more they speak out, the more they echo the concern, the more you increase political leverage. I think it's an important element. We should never lose sight of it. You know, moral outreach at abuses at civilians should be expressed by as many members of the international community as possible. And I believe being neighbors, they have a key role to play when they speak out. Uh, and I know from my own experience, it has an impact. It has an impact. I think it's important that we speak out. This is the point number one. The second aspect is they do have institutions that, that can play a role. Uh, which they may not play currently because of lack of resources. And at times, uh, they are not sufficiently uh, probably briefed or updated on the issues at hand. And those, institu those institutions can be leveraged, you know, to play a role to supplement the work being done by the UN. I believe that POC is such a difficult task that any support you can garner anywhere in the world, you know, can only add value. And of course, when, can't, when, you know, when that support is coming from in a mission deployed in Africa, when that support is coming from African institutions, from neighboring countries, I believe it adds a lot of value. But for that to happen, those institutions, those countries need to be engaged, not only on political issues, you know, when it comes to negotiating agreement, but need to be engaged, need to be informed, need to be updated on protection related issues so that whenever they gather, whenever they interact with the country or the actors concerned, they can also echo the, you know, the concerns and position of the UN. And I believe it increased political leverage and we should not neglect it. I stop here. Thanks very much. And I, I think it, it's an interesting point in, in the sense that, I mean, peacekeeping, I mean, while they are mandated by the Security Council, ultimately, represents the, a, a collective response to violence by the broader international community and it should have the backing of the international community and, and, and I think there is a particular resonance or, or, or value when uh, 
regional institutions and countries which which often have a in in some ways a greater stake uh, in in violence in in their own neighborhoods across uh, their own borders can can be particularly effective in, in terms of their their their, their moral outrage. Um, Ludovic, let me let me turn to you for any thoughts and comments. Yep, I will have two comments on the, um, so first on the political and transparency, and the second on the difficulty to uh, to, to identify the, the 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 good accountability. So first on the political, I can I can say being one of the actor of accountability, I'm not so sure that we receive so much pressure from the political side. Uh, when it's when it's time to 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 sanction or or, or to punish a, a TCC, to be honest, our office has never been stopped by the UAG to 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 reach a TCC or to make any recommendation. And I would even say that the TCC, whatever is their importance, they could be a Security Council member, they could be the biggest contributor. When we talk to them and when we explain them why they always understand and they always appreciate uh, uh, our remarks and finding. And I would say that usually they prefer to have those remarks and those findings to be able to improve instead of having their name shame in medias. So that's the first one. The second one is I want to come back on uh, something which was mentioned by Andrew on Yasser uh, for the uniform, especially the case of Alindao, I think is a, is a of course, a dramatic example, but also is an example of how we can do accountability in the UN. Of course, there was no doubt that the, the contingent failed, but um, um, we can argue on the fact that they failed to react because what can do 50 uh, military alone facing a crowd of 2000 people with children and women who want to massacre another crowd of people where we, we can debate that, especially in the comfort of our office, it's always easy to, to, to debate on what they could have done better. For sure, to they, they, they fail to identify the early warning, that is for sure. But where the UN accountability system, I think, has not failed and has been good, is that at the end of the day, the TCC has been sanctioned, has been repatriated, but that was not the only target. We have also done a lot to support this TCC to not fail again. And there was a huge effort which has been made in terms of training for this TCC. And we expect that this TCC, perhaps in six months from now, will be able to, 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 to come back again in the UN peacekeeping with a, an, an increased amount of troop. And we can tell you that they have taken it very, very seriously. A second part in the recommendation and in the finding in the case of Alindao was also to better identify the early warning mechanism and to deploy the civilian pillar and the substantive pillar in very sensitive area. And the mission has done it and it was a success. So I really want to emphasize on the fact that we are taking it seriously and the more it goes, the more I think our system of accountability is improving. Thank you. Thanks Ludovic. And I think uh, for all the discussion about transparency, I mean, if, if if I got you, part of what you're highlighting is that in some cases, a degree of discretion has actually been helpful in in securing the trust and cooperation of contributing countries, which has led to their own improvement in 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 behavior and in in performance. So there, again, there may be uh, it's not always a, a a black and white situation. Exactly. Um, Andrew, please. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and uh, I think that uh, fellow panelists, uh, Yasser and, and Ludovic raised really good examples that in characterizing that, that these are very complicated and, and in many times uh, unique situations and that every situation is unique. Um, it's gonna, there are gonna be different challenges. So, you know, we're, we're working to, uh, against something that, that, that's a very compli complex situation, you know, for a national military, let alone a, a peacekeeping force. Um, so do recognize that. I, I think from the, the political will standpoint, if, if we do start from that common understanding of, uh, of a shared goal of, we all uh, want a, a peacekeeping force that's able to carry out its mandate effectively and, and safely. And, and a large part of many of these mandates is the protection of civilians. So if we 
if we agree on that common understanding, then um, then we're talking, you know, a, a little bit, but we're talking about how to get there rather than disagreeing over what the ultimate outcome is. So if we agree on that, and, and I think we can um, then look at Allendale uh, from a different angle of, okay, if, um, if we agree on, on the intended outcome of what we wanted in that particular situation, um, did the uh, against the accountability framework as it's laid out from uh, from September, um, did everything go perfectly according to that framework? And and of course the the answer is all you know almost always going to be you, you're never going to get 100. percent But what could we have changed from that situation? And and one of the things that that keeps striking me is that. Uh, that issue of transparency drove a lot of the subsequent kind of um, ways that that particular situation played out. Um, so remember how, you know, how did the world kind of find out about that situation? Um, it, it was largely through the press. And so if, if that particular uh, scenario had gone through all the measures of the accountability framework instead, I think you know it's it's a it's a much different conversation and a little bit it, it changes the political dynamics as well because then we're talking about okay how can we how can we make improvements here how can we um, or, or rather what are the measures that we can take uh, that will prevent or or help supplement here um, what's needed uh, rather than this kind of um, uh, not I wouldn't I wouldn't go secretive but this uh, this lack of transparency, and then when it gets uh, when it gets out in the open, it just seems that much worse. And so I think if we start with transparency, where these things are reported through the proper uh, channels as as laid out in all these different um, frameworks that have been established, then it changes the political dynamics because then we're talking about okay, where um, where were there positive examples here? Where were units and individuals uh, acting? Um, appropriately and heroically, and how do we recognize those actions? Um, and then, okay, these these were the things that didn't go so well. Um, what were what was unit lacking? Um, uh, how how do we address those? And kind of the, that specificity allows us to then, um, uh, you know, if we're talking about resources, uh, understanding exactly what's needed um, is much more uh, helpful and much more effective in in getting resources. Um, and so I think uh, it just kind of comes back to that issue of transparency and, and with more transparency, you're going to get a different political situation uh, and ultimately that that common shared goal that, that we're all uh, striving for. And ultimately, I mean, this is really about putting in place measures to ensure that the, the types of failures or shortcomings that led to the massacre like the one in Allen are more likely to be prevented the next time around. And part of that process, and I think this is very much the, the argument, Nami, that, that you made in the paper and that A.S. Chiquita referred to, part of that process is ensuring accountability when established courses of, of action were not followed, looking at ways, Andrew, as you said, of uh, working to improve the, the performance of those units that, that are deployed and, and recognizing when, uh, when missions achieve or perform above and beyond expectation, actually recognizing that and, and holding um, good behavior up just as much as, as one scrutinizes uh, underperformance. Um, yeah, sir. Let me let me turn to you, and I think you'll, this will probably be our final intervention before we we wind things up. Thank you very much, Jake, uh, for this opportunity to take the floor again. Um, just uh, taking this opportunity to to, to congratulate uh, OPSP and Ludovic for for their amazing work. Uh, as you mentioned, it's a small office, however, very important, and uh, they're doing an excellent job. On, on the transparency, I, I think, I mean, I, I do agree with, with all what was said uh, earlier, it's, it's very important. Um, and, you know, I'd like actually to, to say something in my personal capacity, but also as a, as a representative of at least Morocco as a TCC, um, you know, uh, participating in a peacekeeping mission it, it should be seen as a privilege. It's not a right. 
it's a privilege to contribute to international peace and security. Um, and, and it's something that Morocco is very proud of. Uh, but most experts on peacekeeping, they also know and they're recognizing of, of all the, the challenges that peacekeepers are, are um, um, have to deal with in terms of resources. And as I mentioned earlier as well, the fact that they're quite stressed, the, the lack of uh, clear instructions sometimes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and just also to give uh, to give to to all the um, the participants uh, an idea about the, the complexity of the discussions on POC. Um, for example, the first uh, I would say thing that always come um, that is always mentioned is the the primary responsibility of the host state. Uh, here we're talking um, in 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 some cases that's in CAR, for example, where, where for for many years there was the state was was kind of absent and uh, and uh, and had control over. The capital and maybe a little bit beyond, but that's it. So that adds another layer of complications in all our discussions on, on POC. Uh, last but not least, about caveats. Obviously, um, it, it's a very uh, critical issue, and, and we, we, for example, uh, as most of NAM countries, don't really have caveats. Uh, we take it as a privilege, as I mentioned, to to be part of, a, um, to participate to a peacekeeping mission. However, we, we, we are recognizing the fact that for some TCCs and for various reasons, they do have uh, caveats. Um, but the caveats definitely impact uh, the performance first, but also the ability to protect um, as needed. Uh, let's say if you have two contingents in the same basis, and one is not allowed to leave the basis at night, for example. So then obviously the other one will be sent to do that once, twice, three times, four times. How this uh, can impact the, the performance of, of this uh, contingent that, that doesn't have caveats and is always uh, requested to, to act in, the, in these cases. So this is just food for thought. Again, it's a very complex issue, but uh, thank you very much, Jake, for this opportunity and thanks to all the, the other uh, speakers. Thank you. Thanks very much, Yasser. And, and as you said, I mean, certainly on the issue of caveats is, is an incredibly complex and sensitive one. And, one could get into to differences between declared caveats and, and undeclared caveats and, and what that means for the ability of missions to, to, to plan and, and factor those in. But I think we could have an entirely separate uh, session on that. It's 1129. Uh, we promised to end it at 1130. So I think we'll end things here. I want to First off, uh, reiterate my thanks to uh, to all of the panelists. Uh, Nami, particularly, um, it's been a pleasure working with you uh, these past several years, and, and look forward to continuing to work with you as as you move across the street and uh, on the on, very much on the on these issues. Uh, great to have all of our panelists with us. Um, want to thank again uh, the permanent mission of the Netherlands and Ambassador Brandt, and of course ASG as well, and to wish uh, all of you watching a good rest of the day. Thanks so much. <laughs>